Hello everyone, this week on We Talk Nerdy, I've got tech news, I've also got a cold, and I have reviews of the Chromecast and Fury of the Feywild, and I'm also going to show you how to make a health potion lamp, so stay tuned. We Talk Nerdy. We Talk Nerdy TV is sponsored by UBU Enterprises, specializing in custom business website design, social media marketing, and online branding strategies for companies and products. Hello everyone, and welcome to We Talk Nerdy, the show about tech news, reviews, and how-tos. I'm your host, Dave Larson. Thanks for watching. My apologies for my lack of updates lately. It's been a difficult summer for me, and I'm in the process of moving again. This time I'm heading to Northern California in the hopes of finding steady work. So this will be my last show for a while until I get myself and my cats relocated. In tech news this week, uh, Motorola, a Google obsidiary, subsidiary, announced their first Google phone, the Moto X. Since getting purchased by Google last year, Motorola has been releasing products that were already in the pipeline since before the Google acquisition. The Moto X is the first uh, phone from Motorola that's been designed and released with a Google influence. And from what I can tell, this is a really great product and I'm thinking about getting one myself. It goes without saying that the smartphone market is a crowded space and in order to gain a foothold, Motorola uh, has done a few things differently in order to try and make themselves stand out. First off, the Moto X is highly customizable. Uh, you can choose from 18 different colors and accents for different parts of the phone, uh, which gives you a combination of more than 500 different um, varieties in all. You can also choose to have the phone engraved, and the hardware itself comes with either 16 gigabyte or 32 gigabyte versions. Now, I'm not lucky enough to have a Moto X to play with, but generally speaking, reviews of the product are very positive. Uh, the fit, finish, and design are all top-notch, and the phone runs an almost stock version of Android 4.2. It's very fast. It sports a 4.7-inch display running at a modest 1280 uh, by 720, which is a 720p display. And it comes with a 10 megapixel camera. The Moto X also comes with special processors designed to handle natural language processing. In other words, you can talk to this phone. And I think this is a really strong selling point. The Moto X listens for your voice and you have to train it first by speaking to it. And once you've done that, it will respond to you and not other people. Now, it's not perfect. Uh, occasionally it does mess up. But uh, from what I understand, it's actually a really great way of interfacing with your phone. If you haven't used Google Now style voice commands, they are really great. You can ask the device questions and it will respond to you uh, and it understands what you're saying. It also understands context sensitive questions and I've got an example for you here. I'm going to ask Google Now. Sorry about that. It took me a second to get my phone or my tablet set up to do this example. Uh, as I was saying, it understands context sensitive questions. For example, you can ask uh, Google, how old is President Barack Obama? How old is President Barack Obama? Barack Obama is 52 years old. Once you get your answer, then you can say something like, How tall is he? Barack Obama is 6 feet 1 inch tall. And Google understands that when you ask the follow-up question, that you're referring back to your previous search. As you can see, this works pretty great on my Nexus 7 when I've got it set up properly. But as you can see, I've got to press a couple of buttons uh, in order to get it to listen to me. With the Moto X, the, it's always listening to you, so you can speak to the phone without ever having to pick it up or touch it. Now, Google Now understands a variety of commands, including opening applications, creating calendar events, getting directions, and even playing music. Google Now also gives you context-sensitive information about things that it knows that you're doing. For example, if you receive a flight confirmation email in your Gmail inbox, Google Now will give you flight information on the day of your flight. It'll also give you uh, information about traffic and weather because it knows you're traveling. The Moto X will be available on AT&T at first, 
uh, exclusively, and then later it'll be available on Verizon, Sprint, and T-Mobile. It will reportedly cost $200 with a two-year contract, and included with the Moto X is 50 gigabytes of storage on Google Drive for two years. Not a bad deal. Even though the hardware specs on the Moto X are somewhat middle of the road, early hands-on reviews are nothing short of glowing. Gizmodo has good hands-on review, and uh, this could well be the best pure-ish Android experience phone available. There are two or three applications on the Moto X that are not uh, specifically generic um, Nexus, but it's pretty good. Verizon has recently notified me personally that in order to verify uh, that I need to verify my employment in order to continue to receive a discount from them. And as I expect, Verizon will be raising my rates soon. Uh, I'm very much looking at the possibility of switching back to AT&T and picking up a Moto X when I do that. I'll let you know how that comes out. And if I get a Moto X, I will definitely give you a hands-on review. In other uh, tech news, Steve Ballmer announced his impending retirement from Microsoft last week, uh, along with the um, uh, announced that their act that their Microsoft is going to be purchasing uh, Nokia. Um, both of these things kind of make sense. There's a lot of speculation about uh, whether or not Ballmer jumped ship or whether he was pushed, and what this means about Microsoft's future. Uh, I suspect that losing nearly a billion dollars on Surface RT may have had something to do with Mr. Balmer's departure. Uh, whatever the reason, this doesn't really mean that much to me. The acquisition of Nokia is similarly, eh, I realize it's big news, but they're the only company that's making usable uh, Nokia or Windows Phone. If Nokia went away or stopped making Windows Phones, then I suspect the whole pro uh, platform would be uh, gone in short order. And chances are this isn't going to make much of a difference. Whatever the reason, like I said, none of this really makes much difference to me. Microsoft is a company struggling to stay relevant in a rapidly evolving landscape. Maybe they'll find leadership that will help them succeed, and maybe they won't. It'll be interesting to watch. But personally, Microsoft squandered any goodwill they might have, I might have had towards them long ago, and frankly, I don't give a damn. I've got a couple of quick reviews for you now. My Chromecast finally arrived, and I thought I'd tell you about it. In case you hadn't heard, the Chromecast is a small video internet appliance recently introduced by Google. It allows you to cast video wirelessly from YouTube, Netflix, and the Chrome browser to any television or monitor with an HDMI port. If you have a flat screen TV made in the last few years, chances are it most likely supports HDMI inputs. The best part is that it only costs $35, and it's available on Amazon and the Google Play Store. Although, if you want one, you may have to wait two or three weeks as the demand has been very high. My Chromecast arrived safely despite being somewhat crushed by the nice folks at UPS. Now, this box contains the Chromecast device, a power adapter, a micro USB cable, and an optional HDMI extension cable. It's worth noting that the Chromecast requires external power, which is what the micro USB cable is for. If your television or monitor has a USB port, then you don't need the extra power adapter. Otherwise, you'll need to use it in order to power the Chromecast. Once you've got it plugged in, you're given some pretty simple on-screen instructions. Just visit google.com slash Chromecast slash setup on your computer, tablet, or phone. If you're using a computer, you'll need to download a Chrome extension. And if you're using an Android device, you'll need to install the Chromecast app. Either way, just follow the step-by-step -step instructions. It just takes a few minutes, and you'll be uh, on, on set up in no time. Sorry. <laughs> Finally, you'll need to enter your Wi-Fi password to complete your connection process. Once you're done with the setup, you're good to go. And here's how it works. The Chromecast requires you to have a wireless network and at least one device attached to that network in order to initiate the connection. For example, when I use YouTube, uh, the YouTube app on my, ne my Nexus 7, 
there's a new icon in the upper right corner of the screen. When I click on it, it gives me the option to view the video on my Chromecast. Clicking the Chromecast button hands off playback of the video to the Chromecast, which then starts playing the video, streaming it directly over my home wireless network. Now, my tablet starts acting like a remote control, allowing me to pause, rewind, fast forward, and even adjust the volume. Now, to be clear, the tablet is just used to tell the Chromecast what to do. It's not playing the video. The video is, in fact, being played by the Chromecast device itself. In fact, I can even turn off the tablet and the video will continue to play. As you might guess, YouTube is already, re already fully integrated with Chromecast, and you can also cast a tab in the Chrome browser by installing a Chromecast extension. As of right now, the Chromecast also supports Netflix, Google Play, Pandora, Redbox Instant, HBO Go, and a few others. I'm sure more support is coming soon, and personally, I'd like to see Amazon Prime added to that list. So the Chromecast is in its early days right now. It's still a little bit buggy. I've managed to crash it once or twice. <clears throat> Excuse me. But for $35, this is pretty much a no-brainer if you have a wireless network and a TV that supports HDMI. I'm not ready uh, to throw away my Roku just yet, but I can see a point in the future where this might be possible. As it stands right now, the Chromecast is a great way to watch shows that you love on YouTube, like We Talk Nerdy TV, and it only set you back $35. Now, I'd like to talk to you briefly about our sponsor, UBU Enterprises. Do you need a website for your small business? Maybe you need help managing your business's social networking. UBU Enterprises can help you. They've helped me a lot. They took my ideas, they added in their own flair for design and execution, and they helped me to get my website exactly where I wanted it to be. I couldn't have done it without them. And the best part is, they're still working with me to make sure that my website runs smoothly exactly the way I want it to. Visit them at ubuenterprises.com. I apologize again for my scratchy voice. Uh, I caught the plague from one of my nephews and, uh, well, I'm suffering through it. What can you do? Anyhow, uh, in the last episode of We Talk Nerdy, I gave you my review of Neverwinter, a free-to-play, massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Since then, Neverwinter has released their first expansion module called Fury of the Feywild. As you might expect, it's a free expansion module, and it adds new zones for level 60 players, uh, along with new features and updates, including new companions, uh, some weapon crafting abilities, and two new elven races, and several new mounts. The big attraction is the new zone of Sharandar. According to the Neverwinter website, once the heart of the moon and wood elf kingdom, Sharandar was nearly destroyed by invading hordes of orcs long ago. Though the war was won, the elven people were scattered. Descendants of the original elves of New Sharandar have returned to reclaim their legacy, and they need your help. One of the big challenges in this type of game is to give level 60 players something to do. Often, that amounts to playing the same content over and over for very small rewards. This is known by MMO players as grinding. The game tends to lose appeal when you're forced to play the same dungeons over and over and for a very small chance of improving your character. This is one of my big problems with World of Warcraft and one of the things that ultimately led me to quit the game. I got tired of running the same dungeons over and over and over again without getting very much out of it. Neverwinter suffers from the same problem, but with Sharandar, they've tried to make the game a little less grindy by introducing what they call the campaign system. The idea is that while the player does indeed have to complete some of the same quests over and over, the content is staged in such a way that by completing daily quests, players unlock more and more of the new zone over time, thus making the daily grind a little bit more interesting and not quite as bad. The second section of Sharandar can be open after just three days, and the following section takes a little bit longer. While it can be a little tedious, I find it preferable to doing the same quest 10 times every day over and over. That's how it works in World of Warcraft, and like I said, that was one of my problems with it. 
All in all, I like the new content in Neverwinter, and Cryptic Studios, I think, is doing a good job trying to keep things fresh and interesting. And I find the Fury of the Feywild a welcome addition to an already well-crafted game. Now, on my last show, I told you about a project I've been working on. I haven't finished it yet, and I thought I would update you on my progress so far. My idea is to create a health potion lamp. In case you missed it, I found some heart-shaped glass bottles from a seller on eBay. I want to fill these bottles with a red liquid that will glow when I place the bottle on a special base that I'm building. I've got the project fairly well laid out, but since I'm moving soon, I'll have to complete it some time further down the road. But here's how it's going to work once I get it done. Let's start with the base first. I mocked up a simple cardboard base that the heart-shaped bottle will sit on. I just taped together some cardboard with gaffer's tape and I poked a hole in the bottom. I've inserted a UV emitting LED, which is supposed to make the liquid in the bottle glow. Here I'm just using a simple LED and when I finish the project, uh, when I get the base ready that I'm looking for, I'm going to use multiple LEDs so it's a little bit brighter. I'm going to make the base out of acrylic and I'll just have to drill holes in the base for the electronics. I purchased a couple of oval shaped bases for this purpose. I want to, the lamp to be powered with a wall wart type uh, power supply so I don't have to worry about batteries. I want, and I want the lamp to work in two modes. I want to have the option to just turn it on and leave it on and I want, also want an option where the light pulses slowly. And as you can see here, I've mopped up, mopped up a simple circuit using this green LED that pretty much gives me the effect I'm looking for. Now, I need a few extra components in order to make this work. Uh, the rate of pulsing is determined partly by the size of this big capacitor. I don't happen to have the right one I want lying around, so I'm going to need to order some parts to get what I want. But since I'm planning on concealing the electronics in the base, I need to find a capacitor with the right capacitance and the proper size for the base I'm using. The capacitor I'm using in this example is just too big, but it shows the proof of concept. The last piece of the puzzle is the liquid that goes inside the bottle. I want something that is going to fluoresce blood red under UV light. Now, I did some research online and I came up with a few options. First off, tonic water, or rather the quinine in the tonic water, fluoresces a really pretty light blue color under UV light. I thought I might be able to get the look I wanted by adding a little red food coloring, but it didn't really get me quite where I wanted to be. It was red, but it lacked that cool, magically, magical, kind of glowy effect that I was looking for. Next, I tried ink from a highlighter pen. I bought a cheap highlighter from the office supply store and I cut it open and squeezed the ink into some water. It wasn't quite the right color, it was a little too pink for what I wanted, but it did kind of have a little bit of, of the effect I was looking for, but still not quite right. The third thing I tried was chlorophyll. It's supposed to fluoresce red under UV light, so I got some spinach and I put it in a blender with some water and I hit the liquify button for about five minutes. I got a very nice green soup out of that, which then strained with a coffee filter. Unfortunately, the liquid was just too dark green for the effect to be seen. It might work better with a stronger light, but I kind of doubt it. Besides, I want the lamp to look red during the day, as it does here, uh, as well as when the LEDs are on, making it glow. The best result I was able to get was by mixing tonic water, a couple drops of red food coloring, and a little bit of the ink from the highlighter pen. The result isn't a deep blood red like I was hoping for, uh, but it seems like the best compromise. The liquid is a nice shade of red when the, light, uh, when the LED is on, and it's sort of a watermelony shade of red when the LED is off. So I figured that's probably what I would go with. And then a funny thing happened. I put the bottle in a cupboard for a couple of days, and when I went back to it, I noticed there was some kind of precipitate that uh, collected at the bottom of the container. I don't know what the material is, maybe something from the pen ink, but I'm thinking that I might be able to filter this out 
and get a little closer to the color I'm looking for. At the very least, it looks a little uh, less like a pale watermelon red during the day. So I'm hopeful that with a strong light source and more tinkering with the liquid recipe, I may be able to get closer to the look I'm after. As I finish this project, I'll give you complete plans on the circuit diagram and what I ended up doing for the liquid inside. But as I mentioned, I'm moving and uh, I'm not gonna have time to finish it before I go. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Uh, remember, if you have questions or problems and you need answers, visit us at wetalknerdy.tv and leave a comment or send us an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Lately, I haven't been able to give this show the kind of attention I'd like to. Uh, short of winning the lottery, I need to find a way to keep the lights on. Toward that end, as I mentioned, I am moving to the San Francisco area soon in the hopes of finding a job that's going to work for me. To be perfectly honest, I'm not sure if this is a smart move, but I'm hoping for the best. I want you to know that I'm not giving up on We Talk Nerdy TV, but I don't know how long it'll be before I put together the next episode. I hope it won't be long, and until then, thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you again real soon. Thanks for watching, Thanks for everybody. Watching, everybody. Bye. Bye.